You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Monday, January 7th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, professor of history from Princeton University, Kevin Cruz, and Professor Julian Zelizer on their book, Fault Lines. A History of the U.S. Since 1974. Meanwhile, breaking conservative news reporting that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez answered to the name Sandy well into her college career. Man, we're... I think we got to be honest about hard, how hard this one is going to be for us. We got to talk is later. Be a about lot to deal with. Meanwhile, the shutdown on verge of cutting food stamps, delaying tax refunds. Meanwhile, ICE agents are spending more time at their other jobs, but deportations continue. Two gerrymandering cases head to the Supreme Court. Independent commissions could be in the crossfire. Meanwhile, just steps from where we are today, a trial to protect Haitian immigrants, about 50,000 of them under the temporary protected status, begins today. And John Bolton says, uh, about that Syria drawdown, not so much. And congratulations, we're now sending troops to Congo as U.S. troops are in war zones is on the rise. Less war, less war. DOJ admits they were wrong in their report linking immigration with terrorism, but can't be bothered to correct it. Congresswoman Jayapal introduces statutory pay-go repeal, and Trump makes the big move from concrete to steel. All this and more. On today's Majority Report, a sort of surprisingly light news day today. Um, We will get to some of these stories, but literally on the top of like some news feeds, you will see this story about AOC or should we say S slash AOC, right? Sandy, let's I want to say talking about that although i can't it's so compelling because it's so unbelievably you need to get out ahead of this i don't know why you guys are being so complacent gotta circle the wagon as a wise man once (laughs) said let's not bring that up now we'll bring it up later um (laughs) jamie is uh uh ill today um so um but the rest of us are here um looking forward to sunday where we'll see at least uh 350 of you at the uh, live uh, Majority Report show, we're um, we're not going to stream it live. Uh, I, I don't know what we're going to do with the video. I don't know yet, um, but uh, maybe maybe we'll uh, you know share it with members at the very least. Uh, we we will see about that. Um, I want to tell you that support for today's show comes from Third Love. They use millions of real women's measurements. Third Love designs its bras with breast size and shape in mind for an impeccable fit and an incredible feel. All you got to do is you just answer a few simple questions from Third Love's Fit Finder quiz to find your perfect fit. Third Love offers double the number of sizes that most brands offer. Cups A through H, bands up to 48 with lightweight memory foam cups, straps that won't slip and tagless labels. You'll want to wear these soft, breathable bras and underwear every day, especially the new cotton T-shirt bras and underwear. But thanks to the 100% fit guarantee, returns and exchanges are free and easy. 
Uh, I uh, do not uh, wear bras. Uh, but a uh, friend of the show uh, writes back and says, um, the fit is great. I usually have to return most bras I order online, even though they're in my size. I ordered two and both fit. That almost never happens. Super comfortable for an everyday bra, but not as boring as most T-shirt bras. Subtle, cute details, so I don't feel basic. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now, they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. You should buy a bunch, right? Because you can return the ones that you don't want. Go to thirdlove.com slash majority right now to find your perfect fitting bra. Get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash majority for 15% off today. Uh, Also, folks, there's no need to suffer through another sleepless night. Calming Comfort by Sharper Image is the luxurious weighted blanket that helps you relax so you can fall asleep and stay asleep naturally. Saul and I literally fight over this. When he crawls into bed with me, you know, I'm, uh, I'm with him half the time. When he crawls into bed with me, it is always because he wants this blanket. It's designed with high-density comfort fill. I never thought about why would you ever want that, like a weighted blanket. But uh, it makes it, sense to me. It turns out that it makes you sleep better. I mean, like you knew it, I think, because I used to layer a bunch of different heavy blankets. Yeah, that's me. what I'm thinking intuitively through the layering. Yeah. But it's designed with high-density comfort fill to provide exactly the right amount of weight to help relax your body. It mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged and helps the production of serotonin and melatonin. And generally, I don't like being hugged. But when I'm uh, sleeping, (laughs) you can sleep better, you feel great, stress less. Plus, made with super soft, velveteen material, calming, comfort, 100% machine washable and dryer safe. The calming, comfort, weighted blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee from Sharper Image. You get 90 days. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to CalmingComfortBlanket.com. That's CalmingComfortBlanket, all one word, dot com. Use the promo code MAJORITY at checkout. Receive 15% off the displayed price. That's CalmingComfortBlanket.com, promo code MAJORITY. And because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep, go online now. CalmingComfortBlanket.com, promo code MAJORITY for your special discount today. And... Lastly, uh, we're not quite there yet, but has your company outgrown QuickBooks? Are shared spreadsheets, manual processes, and legacy systems costing you time and money? I mean, I'll tell you something. I I know a little bit about legacy systems because we switched from a membership uh, a while back. And that is, that whole concept of legacy systems systems i mean you know nothing's terribly terribly sophisticated around here but it, it's a problem It'd be nice to be able to sort of wrap it all into one now uh netsuite by oracle is a business business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform with netsuite you can save time money and unheeded unneeded i should say headaches by managing sales hr and finance and accounting instantly right from your desk or even your phone. Thousands of the best-known and fastest-growing companies use NetSuite to manage their business, and now it's available to you. That's my goal for uh, 2019, to get big enough that we need NetSuite. And, and only HR is going to talk to you guys. No talking, uh, only on the show can that you talk to sounds great. Because right now, NetSuite's offering you valuable insights to help you overcome the obstacles that are holding you back for free. Don't miss out on unleashing your business's full potential with this free guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. <laughs> I know what they I know what they are here though, right? The five barriers. Yeah, the five barriers to growth. Uh, the f- Never mind. Us. They don't have to say I was gonna- <laughs> <laughs> You'll learn how to acquire new customers, increase profits, and finally get real visibility into your cash flow. Get NetSuite's guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth at netsuite.com slash majority now. That's NetSuite. 
com slash majority to download their free Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth guide today. Will you stop typing? I know you're going there directly. Yes, I am. NetSuite.com slash majority. I want to apathetically steamroll over those barriers. Oh, you're going to be uh, totally apathetically steamrolling over that. Um, we're going to have a limited edition poster, I think, at the... Um, at the uh, live show, that's uh, we're going to add that uh, that that phrase to the poster. I think. <laughs> uh, folks, if you have any experience with LifeLock, send us an email uh, at majorityreporters at gmail dot com. They want to advertise, and I want to. I, I just I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, send us an email at uh, majorityreporters at gmail dot com. Uh, meanwhile, let's uh, go. Uh, we have this ongoing situation now with the, uh, the the shutdown and it is uh ostensibly about donald trump and uh his sort of pathological desire for not even a wall but to say that there is a wall now i understand why democrats are not constantly raising the issue of mexico paying for the wall because that's not the only problem with the wall for the uh, for a lot of reasons uh it sets a bad precedent it is um, uh, a lot of people find it morally reprehensible, the idea of building this wall. Aside from the fact that a wall is ineffective in certain areas, it's unnecessary in other areas. It is contrary to really what our immigration, our overall immigration um policy should be. And, of course, $5.6 billion will not get you any semblance of what he's talking about. This is all performative. I contend, as I think we did last year at this time, maybe a little bit earlier in the year, that trading $5.6 billion and let him have his, his ability to say to his uh, people, like, I'm building the wall, is worth a permanent status for DACA recipients, a, a path to citizenship, and permanent protected status in this country. Uh, That is a trade I would make. Don't know if it's on the table, because you got to remember, for Trump, the wall is everything, just for whatever bizarre reason. But there's a lot of people in his administration who really genuinely don't want any more brown people coming into this country uh, and want less brown people here. That is why there is a lawsuit to protect 50,000 Haitians uh, just steps from where we are who are here largely as a function of a 2010 earthquake and uh, was a cholera outbreak that followed that earthquake. Uh, and they've been in this country under a, um, a protected status. May I just add, a, a human-created cholera outbreak having to do with foreign forces there. So, um, but regardless, uh, you know, human suffering and... I don't you don't hear a lot of people walking around going like, man, everything would be so much better in this country if it wasn't for those 50,000 Haitian people who we allowed to be here because their homes got destroyed and have now built families here in roots here. That aside, here is Donald Trump talking about the wall. And now it's really like it's getting so granular that he's literally getting into the materials. Here it is. And as I told you, it's going to be a steel border, and that's going to give us great strength. They don't like concrete, so we'll give them steel. The question was, why do you think the Democrats are going to be okay with a steel border? And I I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because, like, you know, he was a—he he would visit building sites, and so it was just like concrete and steel. Those are the two things, like— if they had worked with brick, maybe it would be a brick wall. Just trying to get the deal done. Here we go. They don't like concrete, so we'll give them steel. Steel is fine. Steel is actually steel is actually more expensive than concrete, but it'll look beautiful and it's very strong. It's actually stronger. <laughs> it just doesn't. It's unbelievable. And, and 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 there was a big story in the Washington Post about apparently. No one in the administration was really aware of what would happen with the government shutdown. They all believed their own sort of delusion that it's not relevant. We 
we have a situation where government workers at this point, they have not they have not missed a paycheck as of yet. They get paid uh, biweekly, excuse me, bimonthly. So my understanding is they have not missed a paycheck, but they also all know that their their paycheck at the very least will probably be delayed at this point. And people live paycheck to paycheck. And there's no guarantee they're all going to get paid back. Who knows how long this is going to last. But as we get closer to February, when you have farmers who have not been able to get their loans, haven't been able to get their slush funds, you're going to hear people like Joni Ernst talk a little bit more about this. You're going to hear uh, Republicans, um, maybe in Kansas, talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Shelly Capito in West Virginia, when food stamps and other federal assistance starts to get undercut, you're going to start to hear about this. You won't hear it in Kentucky, even though that they will be suffering because Mitch McConnell is not a human being and Rand Paul has to pretend like the federal government doesn't do anything. You're going to hear Susan Collins talking more about this. And at one point, that they're going to they're going to they're going to break. Hold up. So uh, we will continue to follow this. What's this next one? Is this him <clears throat> talking about the. Uh... Yeah, let's go to number two, okay. because here is Donald Trump saying something that. I don't think anybody believes <clears throat> even his own people. I'm not even sure his own people would be happy about it, frankly. But uh, it's a little bit, um, but listen to it. Mr. President, can you relate to the pain of federal workers who can't pay their bills? I can relate, and I'm sure that the people that are on the receiving end will uh, make a justice. They always do, and uh, they'll make a justice. People understand exactly what's going on. But many of those people that won't be receiving a paycheck, many of those people agree. 100% Did you hear that? I mean, it was hard to hear. But he said, yeah, I can relate to not having that money. And people will make do. They always do. They always do. And in fact, many of those people who are not getting a paycheck agree with me. I can totally relate to that. It's like. When dad says, give me a couple of days before I come in and cash out your casino. And you're like, whoa, I'm in a tough spot here because I have a couple of assault victims to pay off. And <laughs> there's about a 48 hour window, but you make adjustments. I get so many letters and oddly from pe- from my own stationery from people who support everything I'm doing. <laughs> the handwriting's so similar. You know, there's a lot but, more but, unity but in this country. This is not unique to Trump. That notion of people will make do, they always do. In other words, like, nobody's come and tried to burn down my house. There isn't, like, masses of people who have come to try and burn down my house or pull me out of my home. Or I don't see the people, you know, if I don't see the suffering in front of me, it must not happen. They must be able to just deal with themselves. I mean, that is, that sentiment. Put aside the the, the uh, complete total lie that any of the people not receiving their checks are in favor of this. But that sentiment that they'll work it out, they always do. That is exactly the sentiment that has been shared by um, the wealthy in this country, largely speaking, for decades that it'll be fine. They'll get by. Look, we all have struggles. And, uh, you know, I remember that time where uh, that person broke up with me or I had that argument with my, uh, my mom. That was hard. And the idea that, like, well, they're not sure if they'll be able to pay for their kid's dental appointment next week or um, don't know if I'll be able to buy presents for them for Christmas because we may not have money coming in for weeks. Or we got to cut back on the heating or, you know, it's just going to be uh, rice and beans. 
uh, because uh, we d- we only have so much money, or uh, they're going to repossess my car, or we're not going to be able to make a mortgage payment. I mean, all of these things, eh, they'll get by. They always do. Millions of people lost their homes in the wake of the financial crisis because there were thousands of bankers who were like, eh, society will absorb the problem. That's the mentality that is not unique to Trump. He's just he's just too stupid to realize, like, I shouldn't say this out loud. All right, we got to take a break. When we come back, Julian Zelizer and Kevin Cruz on their book, Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. Down here where the heat's so fine, I'll drink to your health and you drink to mine as we try to make the money we scored out in Vegas hold out for a while. We drink, but not from Russia. We get our chocolates from Belgium. We have our strawberries flown in from England. But none of the money we spend seems to do us much good in the end. I got a cracked engine block, both of us do. Got a house and the jewels. The Italian race car, they don't make us feel better about who we are. I got termites in the framework, so do you. Down here where the watermelon grows so sweet, where I worship the ground underneath of your feet. We are experts in the art of frivolous spending. It's going on like this. For three years, I guess, and we're drunk all the time, and our lives are a mess. And the deathless love we swore to protect with our bodies is stumbling across its bleak ending. But none of the rage in our eyes seems to finish it off where it lies. I got sugar in the fuel lines, both of us do. Got a bite. And the lies that we both love to tell Fail to send our love to its reward down in hell I got put in We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. On the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome back to the program both Professor of History Kevin Cruz and Professor of History Julian Zelizer from Princeton University. Uh, Both you guys have been on the show in the past. You're back with a new book, Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. So, all right. Um, uh, Kevin, let's start with you. Um, Why? All right. Why don't you just uh, list out? That's a big question. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a couple of them. (laughs) But um, let List for us what the fault lines are that you two discuss in this book. And I know this came out of a, a, a class that you were teaching together. What, what are those major yeah. fault lines? Yeah. Well, so there, there are four, uh, well, there are fault lines in two sense. And first of all, there are, there are four big lines of division that we trace through modern America. And these are fault lines of political polarization, uh, economic division and economic inequality. Uh, uh, race is another big one. And then gender and sexuality is another one. But we also mean fault lines in the book in a different sense in that it's, it's not just about these lines in American society, but it's about the lines we tell each other about who's fault for the current situation. And so the media is something that sweeps over all four of those big categories. All right. And, uh, Julian, why 1974? Well, the obvious event that happens that we kind of take off on is is President Nixon's resignation, which is a huge issue. It's a traumatic event for American society. And and in that year, a lot of the different problems that were building in America from from the aftermath uh, of of Vietnam to Nixon's corruption uh, and the economic decline of the decade are all coming together. So we thought really that starting with that moment was a perfect way to launch readers, launch students uh, into this new contemporary era. 
All right. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me from a from a contemporary era standpoint. But is when we talk about the these these fault lines for a moment in terms of just like, uh, you know, dividing lines in which people sort of, I guess, either um, self-select or, um, you know, uh, become sort of a. I guess a, um, a a plane of identity, right? Or a, you know, one of the masks, I guess, maybe, or or, or uh, costumes that they wear. I mean, we've had some pretty serious fault lines, right? Since you know, pretty early on in the American project, right? I mean, the I guess the, culminating in the first Civil War. Um, why? Like, what is different I- I from that era? As opposed to sort of the post nineteen seventy four era, why don't you, Julie? Why don't you take a tack at that, and then, uh, and then Kevin? Well, really, what's happening in the early nineteen seventies, uh, and and at the moment when Nixon steps down, is you see institutions that have been really important in American life, certainly since the New Deal in the nineteen thirties. They had they had really defined the country, the the role of the federal government uh, in. In economic life uh, and and in, and overseas, the union-based manufacturing economy, certain concepts of the family, all of these are really coming under fire uh, by the 1970s. Uh, there is a real lack of trust in in many of the institutions Americans had many Americans had uh, held on to during the period. So so it's less that. All of a sudden, uh, there are these sharp lines that emerge out of nowhere in 1974. It's rather these institutions that had helped push against some of the tensions you're talking about, um, even if they did so in shallow fashion, really started to enter a decade where, where they no longer held the same weight that they had done for the previous decades. Uh, Kevin, I mean, the... So we have a situation where all of these different sort of, um, um, I guess, priorities or the way that people address, you know, themselves in public become aligned in such a way that it, we, we have basically two different sides, right? Um, how much, and, and I ask you this, you know, uh, having uh, you having written um, uh, a book both on, on, on religion in, in our history and uh, particularly like the uh, white supremacy um, in terms of uh, the white flight, how much of it was that following the um, uh, the Civil Rights Act and 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 Johnson's you know um, and uh, saying that we're going to lose the South for a generation? How much of this was that everything sort of became on some level filtered through race? Yeah, a lot of it is filtered through race. Uh, and, and so what you see here is that, uh, and, and that, that, that's an instance where there was an old fault line, clearly, of, of fault lines of segregation and discrimination. And a lot of ways people celebrate that line being healed. But what happens is, uh, starting in the 1970s, uh, there's this move towards diversity, this move towards cultural nationalism, this move towards really separatism across the board, um, um, white, black, Latino. There are new forms of identity that really take hold, and there's less of a of an instinct to, to move to the center. So, so race does become uh, a driving force here. Uh, but it really is, it, it's really one of many. I think it really seems prominent to us in this moment right now when white nationalism has really seen a revival. Uh, but if you look across these past four decades, there are different moments where different issues uh, really move to the forefront. Uh, we just have to be in one where I think race is really, at the, uh, is really up front. All right. Well, let's go through. Um, I mean, some of those um, those four, I guess, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess uh, fault lines and, and and what for you in terms of like pol- uh, political polarization since 74, uh, Kevin, uh, most exemplifies or, or or there was an event or a crisis that um, you could relate to that particular fault line. Well, that's a great question. I mean, there, there are countless ones we could use. The one that I think is really um, uh, illustrative for me is, the, is really the 2000 election, and not just in the way in which it uh, revealed uh, the, the, how closely divided the nation was in terms of its politics, but it gave us a language to talk about it, right? Uh, when those electoral maps stayed up for first, you know, overnight, and then the next morning, and then on into weeks, and finally it was, you know, December, and we're still looking at the same maps, we came up with a vernacular of red states, 
versus blue states, right? That was uh, new so then, become, right? Was that was that new then? Because I don't recall it prior yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. It used to be that, that the networks would do whatever they wanted. So, you know, uh, uh, when Reagan gets reelected in 1984, um, uh, I think David Brinkley uh, on his show talks about how the map looks like a giant blue California swimming pool, right? Uh, uh, and so the networks had flipped back and forth, and that just happened that year uh, that the color red was given to Republicans. The color blue was given to Democrats. You go back past years, and um, I think Time Magazine in 1992 shows Bill Clinton's election, and all the Democratic states are red. Uh, but just because 2000 was the one where we kept talking about blue states, red states, blue states, red states, it's like a Dr. Seuss uh, uh, rhyme, right? Uh, it becomes cemented in people's minds, and it, and it gives a sense that these are two real warring camps. They, they literally have turf. Well, uh, Julian, what do you think about that? It, for you, is that that same moment or uh, or a different one? Well, there's lots of moments for me, and and obviously relevant now is the government shutdown in in 1995 and 96, where where we had had some short government shutdowns, but uh, during that year, you know, President Bill Clinton is in office, the Republicans had taken over Congress in '94, Newt Gingrich is the Speaker of the House. And and they have this terrible stalemate where, where we enter into the longest government shutdown uh, that we've had. And all of a sudden, what would have been outside the spectrum of normal politics, just having all these offices closed and services gone, is, is normalized. Uh, it, it becomes part of how the parties are going to do their combat. Uh, in that case, the major issue was Medicare funding. Uh, and so for for me, it, it's it's a policy battle that really captured where where the two parties were moving and and in some ways, you know, explains the path to where we are right now. If Newt Gingrich was never born, would we even be having this interview? We probably would. Look, uh, every uh, issue has a certain person who who embodies uh, whether it's the divisions or the sentiment of an era. And and Gingrich was certainly not only someone who embodied it, but he was really a pioneer in the style of of partisan warfare that we have. But but the partisanship really was rooted in in many things beyond a person. It was rooted in the way districts were being drawn. It was rooted in the way parties reorganized their primary system and the way things worked in Congress. It was rooted in the dramatic changes in the news media that take place. So I think that's part of what we're trying to say. This is four decades in the making. It has multiple factors, and that's in some ways why the bitterness uh, and the divisions are so intense right now. Kevin, let's talk a little bit about uh, gender and sexuality, because um, uh, how I mean, how much of 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 gender and sexuality is a function of sort of, you know, what we I think, you know, we would call in the 60s, the women's liberation movement, um, the, the divides there. I mean, how much what how does that play out and what events do you see? Because to me. It seems like the 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 birth of the moral majority, right? Like the the, the these things get weaponized in some way, um, as opposed yeah. to just being out there. And that, to me, seems to have weaponized it in some fashion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, you, I think you can trace uh, the origins of, uh, of these dividing lines to uh, to the new prominence of feminism. That's not to blame. A feminism for uh, for what we've seen, but but it sets up a, a chain of events. Uh, feminism itself, at least in terms of its, its prominent role in the 1970s, is in a large way a reaction to how bad the economy is. Uh, by 1976, uh, only about 40 percent of all jobs provide a, a salary that's good enough to support a family. So you have a lot of uh, you know, suddenly of both uh, husband and wife are working in the workplace, and as those women move into the workplace they start to experience uh, uh, discrimination and sexual harassment and all that. And so feminism really ramps up uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the 1970s. And then in reaction to that, you have this new movement of family values. And at first it seems uh, like the, the, the drive for feminism, the drive for equal rights is going to be a no-brainer. If you look at the course of the Equal Rights Amendment when it comes out of Congress, uh, you know, it had been in the works since the 1920s, but once it finally gets out of the Congress in the, in the early 70s, it seems like it's going to pass uh, and get ratified uh, immediately. You know, several states do it within the first day. Uh, but what happens is that uh, Phyllis Schlafly, who graces the part of the cover of our book, 
uh, kind of ingeniously uh, uh, turns the issue around and says, uh, this isn't a measure that's going to give equal rights to women. It's a measure that's going to hurt families. And it's a brilliant bit of framing uh, that, that she does. And, and, and so suddenly you have, uh, you know, who could be against equal rights for women? Well, she frames it as, as this is going to be uh, an attack on families. It's going to be an attack on the rights of women uh, to be cared for, the rights of women to, uh, to have uh, automatic um, uh, um, uh, child support, to have alimony, to have all these kind of things uh, that will keep them uh, alive and well, that women are going to be grafted into the military, God forbid. Uh, there's a whole host of horrors that she raises. And so it becomes about two competing visions uh, of what America is all about. Uh, and the family becomes a microcosm for the nation. And that sets up a fight that uh, we're, we're, still, uh, we're still having today. I talk just a little bit about the the moral majority because it it always strikes me is that like morality became this sort of surrogate a surrogate for religion in some way and we see echoes yeah. of that yeah. where people self identify as evangelicals they vote for Donald Trump um, and it's almost as if like you know and many of them are not actually church going even though they they identify in that way that it's become yeah. a surrogate for something else I mean I. Uh, 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 talk a little bit about uh, that. Sure, sure. Well, so, so the moral majority goes back to something we talked about earlier, which is the way in which there were old dividing lines, like you said, there were old fault lines. And so in religion, what had long kept religious conservatives from uniting is that they had all these different lines, these doctrinal lines between them, right? You know, if, if Baptists didn't like the Methodists, didn't like the Lutherans, didn't like on and on, right? Uh, and so what the moral majority does, where that name comes from, is they finally decide, the organizers of that, Jerry Falwell and Ed Whelan, say, hey, out there is a moral majority who believes at the core in the Ten Commandments. And if we can boil it down to that, what I called in my last book a lowest common denomination, if we can boil religion down to something that simple, that kind of bumper sticker level of religion, um, and not get over the, 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 you know, our different readings of the Bible, then we can all agree, right? So that's where the moral majority comes about, is, is it papers over these old religious differences. But as it does, it injects a new kind of religion, because often they're not going off the Scripture anymore, because that's actually what divides them. And so they speak of this broad general morality. And they get involved in issues that aren't really talked about in the Bible. Homosexuality uh, isn't really addressed at length in the New Testament. Abortion, uh, the same way. And so they come out and they, they, they seize on these issues, uh, and they inject a, a new meaning in them, where they're dictating what is moral and what is not. Uh, and as we've seen over the course of just uh, 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 Falwell Sr. and Jr., uh, that definition of morality certainly changes. And so uh, where Jerry Falwell in the late 90s was saying very loudly, Jerry Falwell Sr., that Bill Clinton had to resign because he committed this extramarital affair, Jerry Falwell now just brushes it off, right? So it, it, it's very much a uh, um, what... Those on the right used to complain about the left. They said, you, said you, you had situational ethics. You know, you had, a, you had a, a shifting set of values. Well, now we see that on the right as well, I think. Uh, Julian, talk about these, the, the, the fault lines in the context of the economy. Because that, I mean, I, there, there's clearly a, uh, a major divide, right, uh, in, in terms of, of wealth and, and income inequality in, in this country. But has has it uh, has that become weaponized in the same way in that it's created polarization? I mean, it, 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 like it's it's the least obvious, it seems to me, within the context of our politics. Well, it's really important. And you have to remember that, uh, again, going back to the 1970s, it's a it's a big sea change that we have during that uh, decade. And, and again, the, the, the period from the 30s to the 70s, you had this very strong economy that created a, a pretty robust middle-class society. Unions were at the core of that society, and economic growth was strong, inflation was pretty low, unemployment was pretty low, and all of that falls apart in the 70s. So the, the two key things that happen, one is you start to see the worsening of economic inequality. So the divide between the rich and the poor starts to become more severe, and that trend will continue right through today. That has all kinds of political effects. Uh, a lot of the money that uh, is at the upper uh, income bracket starts to align with Republican politics since the 1970s, and you see the party shift and embrace issues like supply-side tax cuts, economic deregulation, and, and pretty much line up uh, where those two interests unite 
well, and Democrats to some degree subscribe to this, but but not not as much as with the Republican Party. So so the the economic divisions and the political divisions uh, work in concert. Uh, and the other thing that happens at the same time is is the middle class really starts to struggle. Uh, beginning in the 1970s, Kevin and I write on. You can see this even in pop culture, uh, on all sorts of shows from All in the Family to Alice. Uh, you, you can see the tenor of the economy changing through what people are watching. And the loss of that uh, that working-slash-middle-class economy really changes the, the, Democratic, the Democratic Party and, and erodes uh, one area um, that had been really important to the way the parties were set up. So uh, I think the economic and political divisions actually kind of work hand in hand during this period. Um, let's talk about the the media and the media's role in this. Um, and, and again, just like, you know, it's interesting, you know, I, I interviewed uh, John Sides, who had written, uh, who's, uh, who wrote a book, Identity Crisis, I'm sure you're both aware of, where, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. where, um, a lot of these issues became uh, heavily racialized um, following Barack Obama. The one statistic that, that I keeps echoing in my mind is uh, that 50 percent of uh, non-college educated uh, white folk did not perceive the Democratic Party as to the left of the Republicans on race uh, until Barack Obama was elected, um, and oh. it, which is... Uh, just super surprising to me, um, but uh, that's what it was, and and that may account for some things. But um, what uh, as these sort of different, um, I guess, identities uh, align in such a way that people just find it easier. I go on one side or the or the other. How does uh, media play into that over the past, I guess, forty some odd years now? Well, it's become a huge change. I, I, the the changes are a the the news cycle becomes uh, endless. It, it moves from a period where networks and, and newspapers, you know, uh, basically a handful of networks had a very limited news cycle at the end of the day, at the dinner hour, in the morning papers, to starting with the advent of CNN in 1980, and then moving forward, this endless. Uh, amount of time for information. You saw the media landscape fragment uh, very dramatically, uh, starting in the 80s, accelerating the 90s, both because of cable television and then because of of what the internet brought to to the consumption of news. And and finally, you saw partisan news take hold. Uh, Fox News is is the story we tell about, which is the most dramatic uh, moment of this with its formation in 1996 and and just a a source that's going to provide news from a Republican perspective uh, and and then not even news, just a form of entertainment uh, since then. And, And so all of this creates a media landscape where the divisions, the partisan divisions, these different kinds of social movement tensions all have uh, a great forum uh, in, in which they're going to be covered. Um, information is really hard to control, and so all the different sides can get their stories, facts, and otherwise out there. Uh, and I think that if the media landscape had not been so freewheeling, not so open-ended, and, and not with so many sources that are happy or are comfortable with partisanship, uh, you might have had a slightly different story. Uh, but, but it worked well, so to speak, with the political fault lines of the period. Uh, Kevin, do you think it was the fairness doctrine, ultimately? I mean, you know, as, as prominent as Fox is, it was, it was I think, right-wing radio, which reached, you know, t- uh, 10 times the number of uh, the audience yeah. that, that, that Fox does, and that was unleashed by uh, Reagan's repeal of the fairness doctrine. I mean, what, what is your sense of that? Yeah, no, the the fairness doctrine, when it gets uh, repealed by Reagan's FCC uh, in 1987, uh, is the pivotal moment when we talk about it in the book. Uh, but it's but part of a larger uh, a larger shift, and, and it's not just in terms of the uh, of the fracturing of the media landscape, and that certainly allows it. That, that enables uh, the right wing media to take hold. It enables uh, Fox News to come out, and the the, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, another uh, kind of policy turn that that allows. Fox and Murdoch to consolidate a lot of stuff under their uh, their one belt. 
uh, you get that, that fracturing of the media landscape, but it's also not just where they are, it, it's how they do it. And so there's, there's a change in the media over time. And again, to go back to, to trace from what Julian did, you know, when you have those old three networks, they're all the kind of the staid Walter Cronkite, Doug, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, Brinkley, uh, and, and, uh, and the others are out there kind of giving a, a very kind of down the r- middle of the road line of, of, of being objective. Uh, part of the, the change is the partisanship. Part of it is also the showmanship uh, that, that changes here. So you can look back to someone like Roger Ailes, who doesn't come out of nowhere with Fox News. He's been active in uh, Republican uh, media strategies back to Nixon. You know, he, he's the one who gives Nixon the makeover uh, uh, in the in, in '68. He, you know, he says, you know, people look at Nixon uh, like he's the uh, like he was, you know, 42 years old the day he was born. They say other kids uh, got a football for Christmas. Nixon got a briefcase and loved it. Uh, and so he does a, a good job of polishing that dour Nixon image into something more exciting. And then he becomes a mainstay of Republican politics. Rather. He works with George H.W. Bush, and he's the one who really links George H.W. Bush to Rush Limbaugh, makes Rush Limbaugh kind of an equal partner. Uh, one of the, the, uh, the fascinating things uh, 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 that we talk about in the book is this thing where, where it's not that Limbaugh is looking for validation from George H.W. Bush. Bush is looking for validation from Limbaugh. He has Limbaugh to the White House. George H.W. Bush literally carries his luggage into the White House for him. I mean, it, it's clear who's in charge uh, at this moment. Uh, and so Ailes goes from that, from enabling uh, uh, Limbaugh and the Bush White House, to then crafting uh, this, uh, th- th- this new style of, of media in that fractured landscape. So it's not just about having the space to do it. It's, it's how they do it. And it's a much more uh, flashy, uh, much more uh, k- kind of um, a less dour, a less old-school Republican view uh, in which they really do, uh, they really do go to, to, to dumb it down. I mean, you can look at other people like uh, like Lee Atwater, who was a, a pro wrestling fan, right, and and really craft his campaigns. Uh, the 1988 campaign is done like a pro wrestling campaign. They're going to make George H. W. Bush the hero, Mike Dukakis is the heel, and they're going to stage everything around that. So it really is about the drama that they create. Julian, um, a- a- as we recount this. Every name that we have talked about in terms of pushing this change has been a conservative, right? I mean, so yep. this is uh, this polarization and, 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 and things are changing maybe in the past five or six years. But but prior to that, it seems to me to be completely asymmetric uh, as to, you know, you know, they, it, it takes two to tango, but it doesn't take two to fight, actually. One person can just be getting their face pummeled, and they're still involved in a fight. Um, you, d- why? Why did the? I mean, is this a? Is this a something? I mean, are, are we just looking at basically some type of uh, return to the mean, or just a pendulum switch? Or, I mean, but it, it seems to me that when you look at what's happened in the past forty years at least politically, right, Uh, in terms of the political process, um, the right has been um, has been very, very active in this regard. Like this seems to have been an agenda as opposed to the willy nilly of what was going on in the 60s. That was less about sort of, you know, constrained electoral politics, it seems to me. Well, I'll give you a historian's answer, yes and no. So uh, we definitely push back in the story on the false equivalency that both sides do this the same way and that Republicans and Democrats just got nasty and divided. And, and we make that point that a lot a lot of the way in which uh, uh, the partisanship moved certainly was, was very often driven by Republican strategy and Republican tactics. But, but we also don't see the last four decades is simply this shift to the right, a wholesale shift to the right. And we try to emphasize the way in which progressive uh, actors remain really, really important uh, in, in shaping what the country was about. In the 70s, we cover feminism and, 
and the ways in which uh, feminism impacted not just policy, but the ways in which we thought think about family, the way in which uh, we think about all kinds of cultural issues. Uh, we have a lot on the gay rights movement uh, with the, the, the material on, on AIDS, for example, is I think a really important part of the story in which they push back against Reagan and who, who basically ignored the whole crisis. His, his spokesman, Larry Speak, laughed about the issue. And, and it ends up with their obtaining you know, serious research money. And, and George W. Bush pours money into this uh, to fight against AIDS overseas. And, and we have many stories like that where, where liberalism doesn't disappear, liberal policies don't just go away. Uh, and, and that aspect of American, American politics and society is actually really pretty important and, and still influential. Uh, so, so that's where the no comes in, and, and we're trying to bring that back into the story. And some of what we're seeing today uh, is actually rooted in, in these fights and this counter-conservatism that has been uh, an integral, even if forgotten, part of this entire period. Uh, Kevin, is this polarization necessarily bad? Not entirely. I mean, there's 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 something to say for the the fact that you've got this kind of clear ideological line. I mean, I mean when Americans look back to that uh, kind of that what they see as the golden age of bipartisanship, uh, they fail to remember that that happened because both parties were ideologically mixed. You had liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans. You had liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats. So if you were no matter where you are on the ideological spectrum, if you love to get something done, you had to be bipartisan because half the liberals were in your party, half of them were over there. Same with the conservatives. And so um, uh, there's, there's something to, to be said for the, uh, the kind of the clarity we get and having things kind of more uh, clearly laid out. Uh, I do think there needs to be a, a little more sense uh, of, the, of the common ground. I mean, maybe I'm being naive, but, but I think we need to have uh, some awareness here. Uh, it can't be a kind of unilateral. Dis, uh, it can't be you know one side disarming uh, uh, and, and not the other. Uh, but there does have to be a point where the, the kind of the, the scorched earth politics that we saw that really um, reached amazing depths under uh, uh, really under Mitch McConnell in the Senate over the last few years uh, really can't be the new norm, or, or just nothing's going to ever get done. Well, now wait a second. I, I got. Uh, I want to. I want to put a pin in that last uh, uh, thing. But will you, for for the sake of like people under the age of uh, of of thirty five who may be listening to us, um, what like how? D- what did the party stand for if you had conservatives in the Democratic Party and liberals in the Republican Party? Like what? Why would you vote for one or the other? It often depended on where you were. I mean, this goes back to your earlier point about why some people didn't think that the Democratic Party was uh, to the left of the Republicans on race. If you are growing up in the South in the in the 80s, you may be voting for a Republican at the national level, but your local uh, senator or congressman might be a conservative Southern Democrat who's who's, who's an old Dixiecrat on race. Um, and so uh, a, a lot of those those values depended really on where you were looking. Uh, it only becomes. Uh, later on, when you get a, that kind of more ideological rigidity uh, that you really get that, that clear sense of focus. Uh, there was a lot of disagreement, a lot of debate internally in these parties. And so it varied where you were, what you believed in. I, I mean, uh, in broad strokes, the Republicans were kind of the party of limited government. Uh, and in broad strokes, the Democrats were the party of the old New Deal order of thinking the government could, could solve things. Um, but uh, at a granular level, it got a little more muddy. Well, uh, but uh, Julian... So is, yep. has the conservatives really been the party of limited government, or does that really just translate into the the the, uh, the conservatives are the party who are not going to give stuff to people and rights to people who don't look like me? Yeah, look, the, part, the Republican Party is not the party of limited government. That's just a talking point, and, and I hope uh, right. that's one right. of the things that's clear. It's an issue of prior. It's a debate over priorities. Where where to use government? Republicans have used government on military spending. Republicans have used government to subsidize uh, parts of of the economy and certain economic actors. They've used government to try to regulate morality. So, uh, and they've embraced a strong presidency. 
So, so the idea that they're a party of limited government, I wish that could be just put aside. I, I know it won't be, uh, but, but nothing bears that out in this history. It's a debate and it's a battle over prioritizing where government should be used and what the rhetoric about government should be. I mean, they are the party of rhetoric about limited government, even if they're not right. the party of limited government. Right, but but when we say even even uh, but but when we say even like what their priorities are going to be like, we don't have to imagine what those priorities are. They haven't shifted dramatically. It is always don't spend money on anything that uh, helps non-white people or uh, empowers uh, women uh, to uh, in such a way that they would push back on the power of men. Well, I mean, look, there are there. That's an argument, and that's an <laughs> argument some would hold. I think others can see there are certain parts of the Republican history where not everyone's in agreement with that. And, Over the past forty uh, years, Kevin, tell look, me, I, tell me what people, Kevin, you tell me, Kevin. Over the past forty years, where have we not seen that as a fundamental precept of of the Republicans? Well, okay, I'll I'll argue for this. I mean, I think if you look at what uh, what George W. Bush did uh, in terms right. of, of trying to broaden the party beyond a party that was that was purely white backlash, he really tried to shift it. He failed, but he tried to shift it away from the old Newt Gingrich kind of white grievance uh, policies that I talked about in my first book. Uh, and he tried to broaden the party, both in terms of of of, of the the people he brought into his administration, in terms of Colin Powell, Condi Rice, Alberto Gonzalez. Uh, but also in terms of, of really trying to bring Hispanics in uh, and to say to, to, to say to all Latinos, look, you've got a certain uh, uh, culturally conservative values. You're really like us. You believe in free enterprise. You believe in all these values. You're, you're, you're Catholic. You've got the same kind of religious values as many of us. Uh, welcome to the party. And he tried to do that. Uh, he tried to, to get through immigration reform. Uh, and I, I think he, I think it's sincerely wanted that to be. Um, uh, and yet uh, it proved to be that the other forces in this party, the base especially, uh, was simply too resistant to that. Uh, but there certainly was an effort to do that. Right. OK. But that but that proves my point. Right. Like even the president of the United States, even uh, Bush, uh, a, a political uh, mm -hmm. member of a political dynasty, he couldn't even get the Republicans when he knew it was in their their best interest that they, that was the aposty. Right. Like he he couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, this goes back to the point about the media, right? right. So, so this is why the media is so important on this, is that Bush tried to broaden this, and yet the base is at this point really tuned into Fox News, really right. tuned in to Rush Limbaugh, and they're the ones who really put the screws to the politicians on this. And so in a lot of ways, they become, they become captive uh, to the media. At first, Fox seemed to be kind of just cheerleading for the Bush administration, and by the end of the presidency, they're really setting the course for it. And now we've got the, the moment where, you know, uh, Fox and Friends and, and Trump are, you know, it's, it's practically, he's practically part of his cabinet, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, this has been that way. I, th I feel like, uh, yeah, that's right. Fox and Friends. I mean, Limbaugh is a little bit, um, has has receded a little bit from the popular imagination. I think he's getting tired. Yeah. But, um, all right, well, so, le so let me ask you this. But like, I think, if, so, if I could just jump in, I yeah. mean, I think one difference, Sam, that's important is there, Republicans until recently did at least try to imagine a way to build a coalition. And if you look in the early Reagan years, it's interesting in that they, they didn't understand why African Americans weren't supporting Reagan or, or many why there was a gender gap. But they were at least trying to figure it out and trying to see what they could do at a minimum rhetorically uh, to try to to diminish the gaps that were emerging. What's striking today is that is totally gone. And you have a Republican yeah. Party that's now comfortable being a narrow minority party. Um, but I don't think that was always the case. And, and I think this has been building uh, and, and, and getting worse over time to where, to where they are today. It's funny that you say that because I just, uh, like, and I don't know if it came from one of you guys uh, or it was just a thread that you're in, but there was a clip of Wally George who was sort of like a, um, a precursor to Limbaugh on television who had the rapper TRQ on. His uh, show, who oh, had yeah. been at the the RNC, I think in like ninety two, um, you know, yeah. pushing back, um, you know, and, and, and so there, there was an attempt, like the idea that there would be 
um, uh, rappers at, uh, well, I guess, you know, Trump tries to bring in, um, uh, you know, some, uh, some, some cred. He has his, uh, he got it uh, moment, but, um, all right. Well, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Do either one of you seriously believe that we are headed into a period of less, uh, uh, there's any potential for less polarization without the defeat of one of the two major parties, like, like, like an enormous defeat, or is it, are we just going to keep replaying this? Uh, Kevin, I'll let you go first and then you, Julian. I mean, yeah, okay, look, we're historians, and our training is, is hindsight uh, professionally, but uh, but I'll take a stab at this. Uh, I, I think that it is going to have to take a shake-up like that to really fundamentally bring things uh, to, to any kind of, um, of new stability. Uh, I think we'll always have, as we noted, certain kind of fault lines in the country. But as long as as, a, as one of the two major parties, and that's, that's basically the system we have, we've got two at a time, usually, uh, well, as long as one of the two major parties is... Um, or, or both of them are driven by this uh, this kind of play to the base mentality that has become increasingly uh, popular recently, uh, but but definitely with uh, with with the Trump era, I think we're locked into that. So I think you would have to see uh, a major a major set of defeats. I mean, that's almost where we begin the book, right? The book begins with with Watergate and the Republicans uh, being devastated in the 1974 midterms, and then losing the White House in '76. And throughout that period. There's a move out of old Republicans say, say, look, we've got to abandon this party. Uh, they come close to doing it. They come close to setting up what was going to be a new conservative party. William Rusher from National Review uh, is behind this. And uh, uh, he wants to have a ticket of um, who wants to run in 76, Ronald Reagan and George Wallace. They're going to be the new conservative icons, right? Um, uh, it doesn't quite come to that. The Republican Party carries on, largely because Reagan helps reinvent it and others on the new right. Uh, but that was the moment that the last order really shook up. Uh, and whether or not the Republican Party gets a complete makeover like it did in the 70s, or uh, it winds up you know, uh, uh, going down in flames with Donald Trump, uh, as, as, as might be likely now, uh, I think it's going to take one of those two things to change it up. Now, Julian, uh, just b- before you answer, I mean, based on Kevin's answer there, was not the problem of the Democrats in 76 76- is that they did not go towards their base after having defeated the Republicans. It was the failure of 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 then allowing the base to to drive the Democratic Party, which is what I think left them so vulnerable. I feel like I'm on a game show, but uh, <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> look, I, uh, I I I think the de- I think it is fair to say that the Democrats that Carter moved maybe in the wrong direction in 76 to 80. This was Ted Kennedy's critique in 1980, and that rather than trying to reinvigorate the ideas and traditions of the party and and energize the people most loyal to the party, um, that they moved in this kind of messy, centrist direction, which pleased nobody, and ultimately was not more appealing than the Republican alternative, which did conservatism a lot better under Ronald Reagan. So, so you could argue that that was a, a fatal flaw uh, of Democrats in the late 80s. I would say, though, the, the which one party uh, being dismantled isn't even the answer. I think it's much deeper than that. I, I really think the way a lot of our institutions are working, uh, not simply which party do we have, but the way that parties work, the way that districts are drawn, the way that campaign finance works, and the way that, that the media uh, covers the news, all of these have to be reckoned with if we're serious about moving into a, a new era like we did in the 70s. Otherwise, it's going to be the same. And it's, it's simply uh, a myth, a false promise to say, well, the next president will make things better. Obviously, one president can make things a lot worse, and I think there's a case to be made with President Trump. He's taken all these terrible trends that we have, or damaging trends, and really doubled down at a minimum on them. Uh, but, but it's going to be about reform uh, if, if people are serious about wanting something different. Otherwise, it will keep reproducing itself, this, this political system. Oh, Matt? Sorry. Oh, that's our uh, bell, which means we're out of time. Uh, got, that was a joke on the uh, game show thing. 
Um, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite. Uh, they can't all be gems. Um, we needed a gong. But right. uh, the, the book is Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. It's a fascinating book. Kevin Cruz, Julian Zelizer, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, congratulations on the book. Really enjoy it. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us, man. All right, uh, folks, we're going to move into the uh, fun half. That would have been a much smoother uh, joke, uh, Matt, if you weren't uh, checking I know, I, your... I ruined uh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> Your uh, Instagram feed or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, I need that bell to come right in. I'm sorry if uh, I cost anybody a laugh there. Yeah, that was rough. That was rough, uh, Andy. But it's uh, it's a fascinating uh, book and topic. Folks, uh, that is, in fact, that bell does mean it is... Uh, time to move on to the lightning round in our fun one. half. Makes me think of lunch. But yes, l- is that it, food should be ready. I don't know. That's, <laughs> oh, that's a very Pavlovian oh, know, response, Matt. Because yeah, it's, it's like, a diner thing. Yeah. Like um, no, it doesn't. Maybe like, yeah, diner or uh, yeah. School. This is when you just you just like you like <laughs> eggs are up. Exactly. My omelet's ready. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Folks, this program lies <laughs> on your definitely extra hash browns. <laughs> <laughs> This program relies on your support uh, to do it every day. Um, you can uh, help support this program by becoming a member, by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you go to jointhemajorityreport.com, uh, you uh, also get some extra content and um, access to things sometimes that other people don't get. I'm not going to get too specific. You need to become a member to find out what we're talking about. Uh, but, um, secretive. Approach. Jo- yeah, exactly. Okay. Join the majority report.com. Uh, also at just coffee.coop fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority to get 10% off. And listen, uh, for those of you who are New York city residents in particular, we will put a link to, uh, no Mickey cons, um, uh, fundraiser thing. There are like three or four days left where your uh, donations will be matched by the city times eight up to 250 bucks. So if you give $50, she will get $400 worth of campaign um, uh, money. So um, if you are interested in supporting her and you're from New York city, now would be the time we will put that link in the uh, podcast and uh, YouTube descriptions uh, and at uh, majority.fm. So uh, check that out. Uh, today is Monday. Tomorrow is Tuesday. And uh, the Michael Brooks show happens then. Good transition. Nomiki Konst will be the guest tomorrow. We're talking about her candidacy for public advocate in New York City. Uh, the agenda from fighting Amazon, corporate tax, holding NYPD accountable on a Black Lives Matter agenda. She's got... A real serious agenda for New York. We'll be talking about that, plus teacher strikes, a whole bunch of the Haitian um, protected status for Haitians court case and the activism around that. On the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel this Sunday, illicit history for patrons with Ava Gollinger, who is Hugo Chavez's lawyer and one of the writers of the Venezuelan Constitution. Uh, We're talking about the Bolivarian Project. A lot of stuff there. Patreon.com slash TMBS or, of course, the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel or on iTunes. And uh, see you tomorrow at 7. Uh, check out the Antifada at Patreon.com slash the Antifada. They recorded yesterday. I don't know the details, but uh, they should have a new one up uh, shortly. Uh, Matt? Some members-only content. Three hours and 20 minutes of me narrating Hope Leslie by Catherine Maria Sedgwick. It's volume two, chapters one through seven, and hopefully that's the second to the last uh, installment of that. Dipset. All right, folks. Um, heading to the fun half. Six four six two four six four six. Oh, right. Thank you. Brendan gets credit on that one, though. You just didn't hear him. He was. You didn't project enough, Brendan. Well, here we go, um, so folks. Is it another bra one? Just a reminder: Calming Comfort by Sharper Image is it the luxurious weighted blanket that mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged, so you can sleep better, feel great, stress less. 
calming comfort weighted blanket comes with a 90 day anxiety fee free stress free best night's sleep of your life guarantee from the sharper image you had a 90 day uh, money back guarantee right now just for our listeners you can go to calmingcomfortblanket.com use the promo code majority at checkout to receive 15% off the displayed price again that's calmingcomfortblanket.com promo code majority because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep. See you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half.